Hey guys, um, thank you for joining me today. Um, this sermon is going to be called Over Overthrowing the Kingdom of Me. Uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you and I bless you for what you're doing today and what you're planning to do. I thank you and bless you for the lives you're going to change and save and renew and just take over this conversation and take over this sermon, God. I pray, Lord God, that the lives will be that will be changed will never forget. It was you who changed them. Uh, speak to me, speak through me in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, okay guys, um, I'm, you know I love music, and I love, uh, new artists, and I love putting, uh, putting music in my sermons. Now, since the YouTube rules, I haven't been able to do that as much as before, but I did find this fellow YouTuber. Uh, called, uh, named Brad Steele, and he is a YouTuber. He does reactions and videos, too, but his, on other people's music, but he also does his own music, um, and one of his songs is called Kingdom of Me. I think I put it up on Rachel's Rhythms, and for those of you who don't know, Rachel's Rhythms is where I post the music I like and what I'm listening to, and I probably try most on it a couple times a week, or um, sometimes the weeks are different. Sometimes I post more on Rachel's Rhythms, uh, sometimes I post less, but this week I posted a video called uh, Kingdom of Me, um, which is a song by Brad Steele. And in the description box, I will post um, Brad Steele's YouTube channel, and I will repost the video called Kingdom of Me, which which will um, which will be the backdrop for this sermon. Um, I was astonished at this song. First of all, I didn't even know that Brad Steele was a, was a believer and is a believer. And I didn't know that this song would so lyrically, melodically, instrumentationally, if that's a word, blow me away. It's like... A, a rock song, Ev on every level, the song is phenomenal. But I was even thinking about that phrasing, the kingdom of me. And we live in a world today that is so into yourself. It's very selfish. Like, very, like, it's all about me. It has to be about me. Or do or follow your heart and and follow your feelings and whatever and in the song he talked about a person i assumed it was him who followed his heart and followed his feelings and built up his own kingdom and he said at the end of it it was all it ended in destruction and and he he talked about um how it you you basically follow your own heart follow your own desires in to hell and the and the kind of things that can can lead you that can lead you um, the, the kind of destruction that that kind of 
thinking can lead you into. And um, I was, I was, what I was thinking, when I was listening to this amazing song, I'm like, that kind of reminds me of the story of David. If you don't know, King D David was this shepherd boy who was um, kind of like basically the runt of the litter. Nobody thought as the youngest he could do anything. And then, and then there was, and then after King Saul, he, he, they were looking for another king. Uh, they were looking to anoint another king, so, um, um, they came to the house of Jesse to anoint another king, and Jesse had, I think it was 12 sons. I don't know if it was quite 12 or something, but a lot of sons, and then when the sons were looked over, each of them were tall and built and muscular and w would make a great look of a king, but uh, they just didn't p pass muster. And the person that was was supposed to do the anointing said, "Is there is there anyone else?" And they said, uh, "Well, we do have a little brother, but he's just a little shepherd boy, and he he doesn't really do much of anything." And then the person said, "Bring him here." And when they brought him, the person said, this is the one. I forget the person's name. Um, I'll look at, I'll look up that, that story later. And I'll look up the whole story of David later because this song, Kingdom of Me, really um, reminded me of David and his story. Um, and so, David w was anointed king, and then, before that, we, d we know David killed Goliath, but that was before that. And then he was anointed king, and then, after he was anointed king, he waited for several years. And then when he waited for several years, uh, he discovered that he had the gift of music. So he was a musician. And, but, uh, and going through that, eventually he became king. But when, and he was called a man after God's own heart. So, a man that panted after God, a man who loved God, a man who um, served God with everything. But with all his successes, with all being anointed king, with killing Goliath and being anointed as king and having all the success in his life, um, he got kind of a big head. Um, where success, if you're not careful, the noise can drown out the voice of God. So that's what it did in his case. All of David's successes with killing Goliath when he was young, with being anointed king, with being all of that, um, it kind of drowned out his... Um, all the accolades and everything, like Saul, Saul, 
Saul killed a thousand, but David killed his ten thousand. Is what the people were were chanting. Were chanting, and he got kind of a big head. Um, he was a man after God's own heart, and he still was. But he got kind of a big head, thinking that it was all. He started to think that it was all him. So, what he did is when there was a war, instead of fighting with his men, he sent his men to fight and he was, he was staying behind. And in those days, uh, people took showers outside. They didn't have indoor plumbing, so people took showers outside. So, one day, he was being a peeping Tom when a woman was taking a shower outside. Like, today, it would be like a woman peeping in the bathroom when a man was uh, taking a shower. No, it would be like um, a man peeping on a woman when, when she was taking taking a shower, um, it would probably be construed as, uh, sexual harassment or something like that, um, so anyway, he was peeping on her, and he, she thought, she, he thought, he, he thought she was hot, and he just couldn't, he just was like, oh my god, I have to have her. Like, he was like, she's so hot. He was probably like, y have you ever read, well, I'm so guilty of this. Have you ever read uh, those, uh, kind of those books where they describe, um, the woman's body in grave detail and how the man's thinking of her. It was kind of like, uh, sort of like a Harlequin description. Uh, probably he was thinking in his mind, he's probably looking at her br breast and how the water cascaded down to her stomach and lower and thinking about, uh, about things I can't say here because this is a Sunday morning sermon, but you get what I mean. So he was thinking about all this and, and his, his, um, his guy thinks that, oh my God, I, I want her, I need her, I have to have her. And the thing about lust, here's the difference between lust and love. Lust takes and love gives. Lust takes and love gives. So everything that has to do with lust has to do with taking. It has to do with me. It can be a lust for money, a lust for power, a lust, a lust for sex, a lust for self-aggrandizement. Everything can be a lust. It doesn't have to be like a lust, just physical lust. It can be lust for anything. And the and lust is taking. Lust always takes. No ma no matter what you what you do, no matter what you say. Lust is always taking, and love is always giving. So, if somebody says they love you, and they're constantly taking from you, that's a spirit of lust. That's not a spirit of love. Um, that, that's a spirit of lust to take from a person. The spirit of love gives to a person. So he lusted after her 
and he said he had to have her. So, and he was married at this point. And what I forgot to tell you is the woman he was lusting after, the woman that he wanted in his bed, um, what we would call call now, like a booty call. He totally wanted a booty call with her. And so he sent someone to send for her. And it turned out to be the wife of what we would say one of his, the butt of one of the head men in his army, his right, right hand men. It turned out to be his wife. So, so she came to his room, they had their booty call, they had their fun, she got pregnant, uh, and after, after David found out that she got pregnant, he, instead of coming clean to say, yeah, yeah, I screwed her she got pregnant i'm sorry instead of doing that he wanted to cover it up because sometimes most of the time with lust with lust comes shame um this is something that people don't talk about um the shame that comes after love lust so you lust after something, you lust after a woman, you lust after a man, you lust after money, you lust after this, and you lust after that. And you do whatever it is that your lust dictates, whether you steal, whether you lie, whether you cheat, whether you gossip, whether you whatever. You do whatever you have to do whatever your lust dictates to get that thing. But once you get it, it can feel good for a while. I'm sure, I'm sure them sleeping together felt really good. She probably had, uh, you know, I can't go there either because this is a Sunday morning sermon. But um, she probably had a real good time. Let's just say that. But after that, came the shame, came the covering up, came the lying, came the treachery. And what he decided to do instead of being a man and saying, yeah, I did it. I screwed her. I'm sorry. Um, he, he covered it up. He, he wanted him he wanted her husband to sleep, to come home, sleep with his his wife, so her husband can pass off his kid as his. But her husband didn't want to come home because he was so loyal to David. Because I said he was David's like right hand. He's like, no, I'm not leaving the battle we to come over and sleep with my wife. What mess is that? And David said, okay, okay. Because David started to panic because he thought, um, okay, people are going to find out that she got pregnant when her husband went away. And people are going to find out that it was mine. So often lust whatever lust it takes, whatever lust it is, uh, can cause panic. And that's what David is now doing. He's panicking. He, he's like freaking out. And he's like, okay, what can I do? What can I do? I tried to get her to pass up, to sleep with her husband and pass off the baby's his, but it's not working. 
and what what can I do? So David gets this brilliant idea in his head. I don't know what he was thinking, what he was smoking, what he was doing, but he got this brilliant idea that to to kill his right hand man to make sure his right hand man got sent to the um, front lines in the war and kill him. So, basically, he had his right hand man, one of the people that was loyal and there for him, killed in battle. He got him sent what we would call now to the front lines and he died because David couldn't get over the shame. He was panicking. Oh my God, what if, what if people find out that um, I was with this woman? So after her husband Uriah uh, got killed, his friend Jonathan Oh yes, we all need a good friend, Jonathan, called him out. Um, Jonathan found him, and Jonathan didn't judge him or whatever. Jonathan was like me, Jonathan uh, told a story, told the situation in the story. He said, well, I, he said, you know, he said, one day this, and he told him the sto his story in a way to make it look like a friend of his. And when the st Jonathan started telling him about the story about um, this, this, this man just passing off this baby is his and the whole story uh, David said um, that man should be killed who is he and Jonathan said the man I'm talking about in the story is you and then David's reaction was so was so stunned so Jonathan called his friend out and that that um, that reciprocated that um, precipitate uh, that started David's healing sometime there is somebody under the sound of my voice right now that is um, secretive and they see their son or they see their daughter doing wrong and God has said to speak to that person but you're afraid but sometimes I, I was watching I was saying to a friend the other day this friend was saying something to me she said Sometimes the most loving thing you can do, the most loving thing you can do to people is tell them the truth. And, and the Lord is saying, you, he, he's saying right now, I told you that person needs to hear the truth from you. And he said, I've ordained you to tell them the truth. And you know that you have to tell them the truth. And sometimes the way to love them is to be quiet and let him deal with them. And sometimes the way to love them is to tell them the truth. And, and in this circumstances, in this circumstance, you know that he's telling you that they need to hear the truth from you. That you are the one ordained to tell them the truth. And the truth will set them free like it did with David and John, Jonathan. So, um, 
after Jonathan uh, told him his own story and told him that it was him that he was talking about, David was so repentant. He cried. He took off his clothes. And although the, that baby died, it, it was just like a time of redemption for David. He actually had to break down his own kingdom. And a kingdom could be could be built in several different ways. And in the beginning of the song, uh, Kingdom of Me, he said, I built this kingdom to make me feel safe. And sometimes we build kingdoms uh, of ourselves because we want to, to feel safe. We don't let anyone else in. And sometimes we're vain, but that vainness is a cover for how lonely we are, how self-loathing we are. Sometimes we build kingdoms to ourselves because we hate ourselves and we don't think we're worthy of love so we but we're too prideful to understand that not only are we worthy of love but we we are we are made to love we are called to love and people that who are called to love us and that in that safe kingdom you're building, that money, that money kingdom you're building, you're working yourself to death because you want security. All that honey will offer you security. Um, will offer you false security, but the truest security you can have is in Jesus Christ. You can't work enough, you can't have enough sex, you can't shop enough, you can't gossip enough, you can't do anything enough to feel safe or to feel loved. But when you're building a kingdom to yourself and building walls around yourself thinking that it's only you, you're a part of your own world. It doesn't let people in to really know you. And you are dying to have someone really know you. You have like millions of friends on Facebook. You may be an influencer, but you're so lonely. And the one thing you're dying for is the one thing you're throwing away. And the Lord said, you don't need to die for it because I've already died for you. You don't need to die in the kingdom of you. You need to break that down and realize that I'm the one who will love you. My kingdom will come, not yours. And the first, and there are two, no, there are three kind of levels to this kingdom of you. The Bible says it's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the, fre the flesh, and the pride of life. And I forget what it's, uh, where it's found in the Bible. Um, but, um, you can either lust with your eyes, like I was talking about David, the lust of the flesh, uh, which is everything you feel in your body, or the pride of life, being prideful, uh, being vain and not wanting anybody to see how insecure you are. A lot of people who are 
full of pride and vain and insecure are really scared little boys and girls inside. They're scared that people will think they're worthless, although they act like the whole world revolves around them. Internally, most times, they think they're worthless because they, they understand that all these earthly things that they have is not real. Like, we, we live in a world where people could have thousands of friends on social media and even one or two friends in person, but nobody knows them. Nobody knows how insecure they feel, how insignificant they feel, how just, um, how just lonely they feel and dark. That, that when you're building a kingdom onto yourself, it is so dark. It is so dark. And I'm here to, to, uh, bring the flashlight. Not me. I'm not the flashlight. But he is the flashlight. And he is the real king. And the Lord saying, take yourself off of that place. It's too, it's too much for you to handle. You're not the king because you're not called to be the king. I am the king because I am called to be the king. He said, this is my world and I'm the only person. I'm the only person who can handle it. You weren't designed to handle it. He said, let me take that. You don't have to struggle alone in the darkness. And usually when people build a kingdom onto themselves, like, they make money, make money, make money, make money, make money, make money. Um, it's a very lonely life. It's a very stressful life. It's like they're in it by themselves and they cry. They cry at night because they're wondering, what is all this for? And they may seem confident have thousands of followers and Facebook friends, but all that's a smokescreen. Behind the smokescreen is usually, not always, but usually darkness, usually pain, usually things that they're running from. Uh, the, uh, there are things that they're running from that need to be brought into the light He's like, God said, you need to stop running around like you're some big shot and understand that not only the kingdom, not only is the kingdom not about you, the kingdom is not um, something that is made to hide things. It's made to expose things, and it's made to bring things to light. Sometimes in church, we say, just, just show your best self and worship the Lord or whatever. But we don't really mean that. We need to sh show off uh, your best worship dance or whatever. Be happy, because if you're not... Um, people will tend to judge you. That's not what the kingdom God, of God is about. Kingdom, the kingdom of God is where broken people can find peace. Where broken people could get introduced to the real king. My concern is really, we are, the church is like, um, a drug, like we give people a spiritual cocaine for a few hours, and then they feel better, they feel encouraged, and they go home to the same mess, to the same stuff, to the same crap, 
as they came in with. Because what I want to see is real healing. I want to see real restoration. And not just for a few, but for everyone. God has called, God wants everyone to be healed in whatever way they need to be healed. God wants everyone to be restored. And I'm asking some scary questions in that is the way we're preaching, the way we're worshiping, the way we are doing ministry, is that really healing people and restoring people? I know it does it for some people, but I'm sensing that there is more healing and more restoration that needs to be um, done, but most of that is going to take a real re-examination of how um, the church is doing things. Like, I've, I've, I had this picture in my mind about um, the way preaching is done. And I saw, instead of uh, one person preaching, 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 I saw, in my head, I saw a group of pastors at a long table, just in discussion, in front of the congregation. And then the uh, congregation doesn't only get just one set of notes or one set of things. They get a whole slew of different words. Like, and it becomes not so much preaching, but it becomes a conversation. And then, um, then the, the people, uh, can join in on the discussion and ask questions and like I see I see uh, preach, preaching not so much as a solo thing but as a group and interactive thing because I don't know everything even if I was a pastor I wouldn't know anything I wouldn't know everything I know a lot but not everything and a lot and, uh, and hopefully my staff will know things that I don't know. So if we can all discuss in a group and the congregation can ask questions, I think that's where healing could come because what I don't know, somebody else may know. And what somebody else has to say may bring healing. To, to people and what somebody else in the audience can comment may bring healing to people and it won't be just dependent on one person and what one one couple or one one set of opinion opinions it could be just a discussion and and um the congregation could ask questions because there wasn't anything I disliked more that than when the pastor would say something and I would have a question, but because it's Sunday morning, I couldn't answer it. I couldn't ask it because like we have to be all like professional. It's time for us to break the walls, folks. Um break down the kingdom of us. Not only individual kingdoms, but the church kingdoms that we've um, that we've uh, constructed. constructed. Not the kingdom of God. We can't break that down. But the church kingdoms and the church walls and the church structures that God didn't put in place. Some people, some person long time ago put this in place and we're just following it, just following it. 
um, not even asking, Lord, do you want us to shift? Do you want us to do ministry differently? Do you want us to um, maybe preach differently or lead worship differently or have different structures in place? We, 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 we have to begin asking those things because on a whole, uh, there are lots of exceptions and churches get letters and whatever and there are lots of exceptions to this rule but I think as many people who are getting healed at, at several different churches either online or in person there are so many more people who are not there are so many more people who are going back broken and going back hurting and going back to bad marriages and families who aren't working and people on drugs and people who are jobless and people who can't feed their families. I think, I think we need to break down the structures. I don't think we need uh, to just break down our individual kingdoms. I think we need to break down our church kingdoms. We need to reset, we need structures, yes, but we need to reset the structures and make sure that the structures we are building are God's structures, not man's structures. And we say, oh yes, this is all for you, this is all for God, we just do this for God. But really, we don't, we've done ministry that way. Because someone told us that this is the way you do ministry, this is the way you do church, this is the way we have to do this, because this is the way we've done it all the time. But God is calling for a script flip to really understand how to do ministry on this new level. So. This is about not only breaking down individual kingdoms of money and success and power and all of those kingdoms, but breaking down church kingdoms uh, and building uh, structures that God put into place. When I look in the Bible, I see just how Jesus did ministry and he never sat in a synagogue. He never did ministry in a synagogue. He always did it outside with people. He sat with people. He talked with people. He, um, he socialized with people that other people wouldn't socialize with. And he spoke to people. And he used things that, that, um, that for the day and for the culture, people would understand, I wish we would flip the script. I wish we would really get down and ask the Lord, what are the structures you want me to build? And I wish pastors would ask the Lord, what structures do you want me to break? Or do you want me to tear down so you can build something new. I believe that as many people who are getting healed, restored, delivered, there are so many more people that are going back to bad situations. And I believe that God has called us uh, to be his hand, to be his hand and his feet. But in order to do that, we need to use his structures, not not structures that men put into place. Um, and I, and I'm not saying that those structures are bad. I'm saying that they work to a point, but I believe God is calling for different structures to, uh, to better service the people, to better bring his kingdom to the people. 
and I don't think uh, we should be a uh, part of a ministry, uh, just a part of the ministry. I think the outreach should be the ministry and where we share the word as well as um, as well as uh, give them practical items or whatever. Because in most churches, outreach is a part of the ministry. We either we partner with other organizations or some churches go and help food banks or whatever. Um, but I think even there, there's a divine shift in the way the Lord wants to structure. But we, we don't ask the Lord, what changes in our lives, in our churches, do you want do you want to bring forth? We just continue year after year, day after day, doing the same old thing. And the Lord is calling for the new. He's like, I want to do something new, but your structures, you won't, you won't let, you won't, but with your structures, you won't let me. So you're, you're saying that you want me to build the church, that you want me to uh, do all this, but you won't give me, he's saying, but you won't give me the freedom to do it. I need, he said, I need you to let go of the structures. Not of structure. We need structure. We need order. But it needs to be my order. And that's how you tear down your kingdom. Because your kingdom is all about you, your lust, your flesh, your what you see. But he wants his kingdom to, to be about him. And when you replace you with him and replace your structures or structures that you've heard of with his structures, you'll see you'll see people running to the church like never before. So God, so God, um, teach us how to rebuild, rebuild your kingdom and take down ours. Teach us what you want us to know about the structures in our lives and the structures in our churches. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, guys, I will see you soon. Take care. Bye. See you next week. And when you read, when you, when you, when the Lord will build his structures, you will see people coming into the church like never before because he knows the tools and he has the resources uh, to make these structures workable and, and to, to just see, like he has the resources and the tools. We just need to tear down our structures and what we think uh, his kingdom should look like and ask him what his kingdom looks like in this new millennium and he's and he wants to give revelation to all different kinds of people but we just need to be available to him he's ready to ship but he's saying are we ready to ship we're often waiting on God to be ready but God is waiting on the church to be ready and unafraid to go where he wants to go. We often say, Lord, you can do whatever you want and do whatever. But really, we're afraid to let him do whatever he wants to do. We like our structure. We like to know what's coming, coming in next. But our structure can mean can mean death to his plan and life to our own, but 
I would rather death to our plans and life to his. And he wants to give revelation within those structures, within his structures, will come revelation that we've never even thought of before, that we could have never dreamed. Resources and people that we we have never thought of as kingdom before, like environmental structures and uh, structures to deal with people from the LGBT community, LGBTQ community. He has different structures to deal with uh, uh, the violence on our streets and education. And when I say structures, I don't mean programs. I mean different kingdom strategies, whether they be programs or something else. He's got revelation for days, but he just needs somebody available and somebody radical enough to flip the script uh, from what we've done every every year and every time he wants to flip the script but he's asking us if we're ready to do it because this flipping of the script will be a radical shift in some cases he's saying are you ready he's saying are you ready to be radical he's saying this this radicalness will sometimes um, bring about pain, bring about suffering, but at the end, his kingdom will rise and stand. He's saying everything that's building these structures is not going to be easy. He's saying that it's going to take work, it's going to take pain. You may, you may lose some people at your church. Because they'll be like, what are you doing? But he's saying, just keep building. My kingdom will stand. My word will stand. And I will send the remnant uh, to help you with resources and whatever. He said, I'm building. He said, when people are building new structures, it is often a mess. I don't know if you ever come to a construction site, but it is a mess until you get the building into place. But you need the messy foundation to build upon. He's saying both in your um, individual life, it's going to be a messy, he wants to build his structures. He wants to build his kingdom. And corporately, in the body of Christ, he wants to build new structures, new kingdoms. He wants to build new ways of preaching. He wants to build new ways of worship. He wants to build new ways of different things. But we need to be ready for a radical shift. And thank you, Lord, for just your word. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. It's awesome. I, I, I'm loving this. Uh, so, guys, I thank you um, for what you're doing. And I just thank you for being with me. And I thank you just because of your support for my ministry and for myself. And for the ministry. Let me Let me correct that. Thank you for your support of the ministry he's put in me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Take care.